to open up uh, this session. It's a real pleasure and honor to introduce um, our panel for today's Distal Occlusion Forum. Uh, Dr. Pedro Navia, Professor Peter Schramm, uh, Dr. Uh, Dimitri Skripnik, Dr. Vladimir Gabrilovich, and Professor Carnosan um, join us uh, here today and will share their experience with uh, treating distal occlusions. And without much further ado, I'll pass the microphone to uh, Dr. Navia, who will be the moderator for today's session. Thank you very much, Olaf. Welcome, everybody, and welcome to the assistance uh, of this forum. Uh, thanks to Penumbra for organizing this, this meeting, this webinar. I'm sure that we are going all, uh, to learn a lot uh, from ah. the professors and also for the assistance with their questions. Please uh, don't hesitate to make um, to think on your thoughts, whatever you want to say in your questions, okay? And we will transmit it to the professors. First of all, I want to introduce the, the team of the digital uh, medium vessel occlusions. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. And we will talk a little bit about this distal and medium vessel occlusion. Where are we today? Yeah. So what the guidelines tell us about these distal uh, occlusions? Uh, really, we have a 1A uh, evidence only for the occlusions you know, in M1, not for M2 or M3 occlusions, neither for ACA, ACP. We have 2B for this. But look, we have the same level of evidence for the basilar occlusion. I'm sure that all of you that are treating patients, uh, stroke patients, are doing basilar occlusions too. So we have to look for this evidence. Why? Because in, in these distal occlusions, we have a very, very hard stroke sometimes. We can have an M M3 occlusions with hemiplegia, fascia, neglect, and anopsia. The anterior severe artery can be also very disabling with aphasia, contralateral weakness, sensory alterations, and the posterior cerebral artery also, an occlusion in a P2 uh, segment of the cerebral posterior artery can become a uh, thalamic and upper trunk syndromes or aphasia, anopsia. And so we are talking about very disabling strokes too. So we are going to show this uh, first four questions to all of you to, to know where we are. Please tell us, do you habitually treat a non-dominant M2 or M3 occlusion? Uh, we have some answers. Yes, if the stroke is not established and large on CT, MRI, perfusion CT, regardless of the clinical severity. Yes, if the stroke is not established and large on this CT, MRI, perfusion CT, and it's clinical justified, uh, an AH of five, for example. C, only if it is a secondary occlusion after a more proximal treatment, secondary embolies, or D, it would be D, not usually. Please tell us. So, uh, more of the of half of you, or half of us, uh, have respond yes. If the stroke is not established and large on CT, MRI, perfusion CT, and it's clinical, clinically justified. So we will see about all of these things uh, during the during this session. Yes. So uh, we are having some papers, new papers. This is from uh, last year interesting paper talking about distal um, medium vessel occlusion. And, and in this paper, they analyze the treatment with intravenous alteplas. And it's very interesting because it's a um, amount of patients of 200 and more than 250 patients. Most of the patients uh, had occlusion on the M2 and the median NIH was seven of these patients. 
and look at the results. 50% of the patients in our study did not achieve excellent outcome at 90 days with best medical management. 33% of, of the patients were not functionally independent. A recanalization or follow-up imaging was strongly associated with favorable outcomes, but was only achieved in 47% in spite of treatment with intravenous catheters. To all these patients, they did an angio-CT the day after the treatment, and 47%, only 47% had a good recanalization. So we are talking about a, a real problem that we have not a, a, a good solution, or maybe, as they say, and the vascular treatment should be explored as an alternative treatment option. In the editorial of uh, this uh, number of stroke in November, uh, they they say that also the randomized clinical trial, trials that definitely evaluate safety and efficacy of the vascular treatment in this population are urgently needed. So we have to do it. Uh, Goyal talk about MEVOS, eh, medial vessel occlusion, and this is uh, another paper uh, from last year. And uh, he introduced a very interesting, because he's not talking only about anatomically, yes, and anatomically, yes, and two, and three, and two, and three, P2, P3 segments, but he talks also about function. And this is an important point. And there must be a substantial clinical deficit. And we will see it during the, this afternoon, yes? And he put the limit in an NH of five. And what constitutes the M1 segment of the middle cerebral artery? Sometimes we are not sure what is, which is the M2, yeah? Uh, he said that M2 segment is from the main bifurcation or trifurcation of the medial cerebral artery to the circular surface of the insula. But we know also that we have a lot of variants and sometimes it's not, it's not easy to know which is the M2. And we have to take into account that if we are treating a dominant M2 or a non-dominant M2 also. In this uh, paper uh, from last year also, we analyzed from the PROMISE study the patients that we treated with the M2, uh, comparing them to the M1 segment of the medial cerebral artery. And the conclusion was that the treatment has the same safety and efficacy as uh, the treatment of the M1. So it's quite clear that we have to do the M2 uh, occlusions. In this paper, uh, it's interesting from the distal traumatic summit group, he talks, they talk about distal medium vessel occlusions. And I think that this is maybe more interesting than talking only about medium vessel occlusions because they introduce the uh, diameter of the artery. And this is absolutely important. The diameter must be between 0.75 to 2 millimeters. So we are talking about M3, M4, from A2 to A5, from P2 to P5 arteries. And we are really used to treat these patients because sometimes we have secondary uh, embolies. For example, in this patient that we have this M1 occlusion, here you are the angio, we go with a jet seven, we do an aspiration and the M1 is open, but we have a, an M3 uh, occlusion. So we are there with the jet seven in the M1 and it's not, uh, we can go quickly with the three max there. There you have the three max, do another aspiration and recanalize in the whole of the artery and the territory of the artery to, to catch a ticket three, yeah? okay, result. So we are used to the, do this, but another thing is the primary distant media vessel occlusions. When a patient comes with the distant occlusion, so we have some problems with this. We have a lack of definition and level of detail of the prognostic scales because probably they are not uh, telling us the importance of these occlusions, of this stroke. 
Uh, we have the uh, development of alternative treatments as technique plus so that maybe when we do that our duties will be better if it works. We have difficulties in the diagnosis and lack of ability to detect medial vessel occlusions. It's not that easy to uh, to find an occlusion in an M3 artery. Uh, most in some centers that they don't have a specific neuroradiologist. It's not easy to do a correct anatomical and clinical correlation to know if this stroke, this occlusion is really disabling. The occlusion is accessible in the vascularity or not. This is another question that we have to check when we do the angioscopy or the MRI. And another thing is talking about the ticky post the TG post is not the same uh, of the, uh, an N1, so we have to also look for it and, and know what we are telling when we, when we see a 2 and C or a 3 after doing a distal vessel occlusion treatment. Sometimes, as I say, it's very difficult to know where is the occlusion, even in the angio, and we have to do uh, different uh, projections or just wait a little bit for the late phase. In the late phase, you know, we can see that we have there the occlusion. Yeah? We, we go there with the three marks, and this is after the recognition. There is a low ability of suitable devices, this is true, yeah. and uh, the treatments in distal arteries are more complex. I think we all agree about this. Um, my first choice in this case is going with uh, the Primax or the GT in this in this way. Yeah? Never max penumbra just seven D, and then the Primax. <laughs> we have different uh, diameters depending on the artery. We we want to go to the artery with the biggest uh, catheter that, that we can. And this is, you know, sometimes the, the clot is just uh, like this. We retrieve the catheter. So why the, oh, this is, uh, this is another question, another poll question, thank you. What is your technique of choice for the treatment of distal occlusions? Direct aspiration, external retriever and distal aspiration, extend retriever and proximal balloon occlusion, Centrival distal aspiration and proximal balloon occlusion or inch arterial RTPA. Please tell us what is your opinion and what is your way to treat the patients. So, uh, almost half of the patients did direct aspiration and 40% extra retriever and distal aspiration. Combinate treatment. Okay, thank you. Really? So, what do I like distal aspiration as the first option? Look at this distal uh, occlusion. And uh, I'm going there with a 3 max, just impact as we do an, in an N1, impacting the 3 max in the clot, and after aspiration through the pump, look what it was beside the occlusion. Uh, so it's, it's more frequent to find these kind of elongations and a lot of branches in distal arteries. So I find it's safer if I can go with a Primax or a GP uh, to catch one of these clothes. This is, a, this is a, another treatment. We have a, also a distal and three occlusion. Sometimes you have to wait uh, we see in the first phase, we see the occlusion there, but please wait until later. And we'll see that the occlusion is really uh, far away. And we have to go there to do the aspiration, the correct treatment. If we, if we don't impact the catheter there, we are not going to achieve the recanalization. And this was uh, after the treatment, okay? And sometimes we have a fragmental Clots. Sometimes we find this. Look, this was an two, distal and two, and ACA uh, occlusion together in a patient. So when we see it, we know it is going to be uh, a long treatment. But sometimes not not that much. Uh, we go here with an ACE. 
we will have the three occlusions. So after recognition of the M2 with an ACE, the, let's go to the distal M2 with an uh, three max. This is after the canalization and the ACA recognition after the three max also. And what about the posterior cerebral artery occlusions? It is safe also. This, um, this paper has been just uh, published. In, this is a, about a posterior occlusion, a registry, a multicenter registry, in P2 and P3 occlusions. And it seems that if reasonable, safe, and technically feasible, eh? especially if patients were not eligible for an intravenous treatment or presented with high NIH scores, and more than 10 points. This is a treatment in a P2. Uh, do you habitually treat a P2 or a P3 occlusion? Please tell us. Yes, if the stroke is not established and large on CT and perfusion CT, regardless of the clinical severity. Yes. Uh, if it's not established and it's clinically justified yeah, in the NIH more than 10, only if it is a secondary occlusion after a more proximal treatment or not usually. Don't think about doing a treatment in these segments of the posterior cerebral artery. So uh, most of, uh, of us think that not usually, eh, but um, almost, almost the same as if clinically is justified and not established. Okay, thank you. So this is a treatment in a posterior cerebral artery. This is after recanalization and uh, with a GD. And here we have a patient with a, uh, with a, a total occlusion of the internal carotid artery and also a distal uh, posterior cerebral artery. So first we went for the yeah, SCA treatment, this is recanalized, and then we went to the posterior cerebral artery with a FEMAX, but it, it, it didn't work. Maybe we, we, because it was not, uh, uh, the, the catheter was not enough big for the clot. So then we, we decided to go with a GD. So over the FEMAX, we may go I can emphasize the posterior cerebral artery safely. And after that, this I find this is a, a good option. I'm sorry. Okay. After that, we deliver a stem retriever and keeping the JD in the posterior cerebral artery, we retrieve the stem retriever. So we minimize the possibilities of. Uh, Doing having an embolization in the internal artery, artery. So, and this is after the treatment. Okay, so this uh, combined treatment with distal aspiration is a good option. Too. So, thank you very much, um, and uh, I hope to welcome you in Madrid uh, with our face clear, not with this soon. Okay? And we 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 go for the for the next. Uh, for the next talks, uh, so we are going to show all these things with with uh, typical cases and with different techniques. So I think we could go directly with uh, Professor Skripnik that has prepared uh, his talk. Uh, professor Skripnik is interventionalist and professor at the Moscow State University of Medicine. Thank you very much. Uh, being with us, and I'm going to stop to share my my talk. I think here it is. And please, Professor. Good yes, morning, everybody. First of all, thank you for inviting me to this uh, great webinar. I think that mechanical thrombectomy for uh, distal occlusions is uh, most difficult topics in interventional neurology. So. I must show my potential conflict of interest. So it is well known that uh, potential benefit of mechanical thrombectomy for uh, brain circulation is falling down from proximal to distal brain circulation. At the same time, the risk of complication is increasing and some of uh, them can be uh, life-threatening and very dangerous. 
In our everyday practice, we usually deal with uh, two different scenarios of uh, mid and distal vessel occlusion. The primary distal occlusion and secondary distal occlusion. Secondary to mechanical trophobectomy for proximal parts of the cerebral arteries or after trembolites. The main question is who is proper candidate for mechanical thrombectomy? Uh, if you're talking about proximal parts of arteries, uh, we have a sufficient number of uh, studies, we have good evidence, uh, highest class of recommendation, and usually we have no doubts uh, in choosing the proper candidate for mechanical thrombectomy in case of ICA and uh, M1 occlusion. But for M2 and M3 segments, the level of evidence is low, class of recommendation is low, and at the present time, the different stroke teams from different hospitals need to have their own algorithm how to treat such patients. So this is our approach to the ligable for thrombectomy in uh, patients from distal vessel occlusion. So, for, prox for primary distal occlusion is disabling stroke plus uh, safety acceptability for neurointerventional devices. For secondary distal occlusion, functional significance of blood supplied brain tissue because uh, the vast majority of the patients is on general anesthesia. But the main, the key point, according to my knowledge, is for primary distal occlusion is detection of viable brain tissue. So I will show you the first case. Um, four hours from symptoms onset, uh, an age drop scale 13, aspect 7. So for case of M1 occlusion and IC occlusion, it's enough to make a decision about intervention. But this is the case of distal occlusion. This is M2 occlusion. For such patients, we strongly need CT perfusion. Please look at the uh, CT perfusion map. Mismatch is low, and we clearly understand that almost all brain tissue is lost. This is not candidate for mechanical thrombectomy. This is the uh, last case, uh, the case from yesterday. Uh, 55 years old male was admitted to our hospital five hours from symptoms onset. Uh, an age stroke scale, 9 aspects, 8. We also see M2 hyperdacity sign, and on CT angiography we see lost M2 branch. So the perfusion looks much better. A lot of viable tissue, a mismatch, more than 6. And this is typical candidate for thrombectomy. This is image from CAT lab, frontal and lateral view. We don't see the uh, lesion side. We need to find best projection, best point of view, and now we see thrombus in the proximal part of M2, it's middle vessel occlusion. We put a 60 catheter, one pass of uh, aspiration, and we catch the thrombus. Today, NIH uh, stroke scale is 1, 24 hours after mechanical thrombectomy, patient is fully recovered. So, this is another case. Also typical, secondary distal occlusion after mechanical thrombectomy. So it's not typical, it's not anterior circulation, but posterior circulation, but the uh, vessel diameter absolutely typical for small devices. We need to catch these thrombus with smaller devices, no, not as 60 catheter, but 3 max. We can use this uh, large bore catheter as the aspiration catheter. This um, good angiographic and clinical outcome. This is another typical case, secondary uh, distal occlusion after thrombolysis. So the patient was admitted to our hospital with M1 occlusion, uh, severe neurological deficit, and um, thrombolysis was started at CT scan as usual. Patient was uh, transferred to CAT lab, and what we see now, we see uh, thrombus dislodgement during thrombolysis to the distal circulation. On this case, I would like to show you typical aspects of mechanical thrombectomy for middle and distal occlusions. Three key points. Good projection to see the target lesion on standard projection as well. Image 
magnification and general state. Let's take a look. This is the typical frontal and lateral view, and we not clearly see the target lesion. Let's move the arc, and now we see the target lesion. We also see the good route for recanalization. Next, we need image magnification to precise moving our neurointerventional tools. And this moment is not a good moment for head movement. That is why we need general anesthesia. So the thrombus is sketched, you can see here, it's an absolutely typical case for M3 uh, reperfusion catheter. So if you're talking about uh, technical aspect of thrombectomy for mid and distal occlusion, we have two difficult, different approaches. First of them is aspiration with low profile reperfusion catheter, according to size of your uh, artery. Diameter as alternative, we can use large bore microcatheter. And another approach to use low profile microcatheter and baby retriever. We also can use it. So, another case uh, patient was admitted to our hospital with a still elevation myocardial infarction, but our cardiologist said for us, so we have a problem because patient is totally aphasic. And you can see embolus to uh, M2 branch with a uh, hyperperfused area, no core. So we treat that such patient with a uh, baby retrieval device, combination with A68 and small retrieval with good angiography and clinical outcome. Patient was discharged from our hospital with MRS0. So, and the conclusion. Mechanical thrombectomy may be reasonable for carefully selected patients with a distal and deep vessel occlusion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dimitri. Uh, wonderful presentation, very spectacular cases. Thank you. I, I will I will want to to make you a question there was a question uh, from the audience uh, talking about the general anesthesia uh, uh, well about anesthesia uh, but it was important not to have uh, general anesthesia i find it is absolutely essential uh, i saw that is your is your view also about this but, yes I, I just talked about uh, for proximal occlusion, sometimes we use uh, just a consciousness sedation. But for mid and distal occlusion, we need precise movement of your neurointerventional tool. That is why I strongly recommended adrenal anesthesia. Adrenal anesthesia only. Yeah, so we, we have um, other panelists that I, ha I couldn't uh, introduce before. Yes, but Olaf did it. But do you do you do you do the same? Do you do your distal occlusions under general anesthesia? Uh, ramp, Parenson. Yes, we always do it. Uh, uh, as as Professor Scribman said, in in some seldom cases we perform proximal thrombectomies under. Um, not under general anesthesia, but under conscious sedation. But the vast majority is done under general anesthesia, and all cases for more distal occlusions are performed under general anesthesia. Yeah, for the same reasons just mentioned. The same for us we do under general yes. anesthesia to avoid complication and uh, to see the, the occlusion site because sometimes if the patient is moving. We don't see where is the occlusion. Kavilovich also. Yeah, uh, I think that the general anesthesia is mandatory, and that the conscious sedation would be a great way to have a mass, because we are proximally. Proximally is a different story. We can do it with the conscious sedation, but while we are on M2, MT3 segment or A to A3 segment segment. I think it is not possible to do without the conscious sedation, avoiding the complication. I agree. Professor Skrivnik, um, how often do you treat distal vessel occlusions in your personal practice, in your hospital? 
in your region? Uh, thank you for the great question. Uh, so in our own practice, I'm talking about my own hospital, so we treat patients with interocclusion uh, nearly in 50% of all thrombectomies. It's middle and distal occlusion, be, be, beyond and one. And the mean NIH score for such patient was 15. We treated only severe uh, patient with severe neurological de deficit. So, I also have uh, data from Moscow Stroke Registry, uh, the same data. Uh, nearly 15, uh, from uh, 14 to 15 percent of patients from different hospitals. Uh, in Moscow, we have uh, at this moment 12 uh, comprehensive stroke uh, centers for stroke patients. Uh, this is the uh, stroke network of Moscow. Uh, and uh, nearly 15 percent uh, admitted with uh, primary, I, I'm talking only about primary distal occlusion and not, do not have uh, information about secondary occlusions, only about the prim primary. So, uh, and we, we have uh, some uh, interesting information from my hospital. So, uh, the time from puncture to recanalization is uh, not so good, uh, plus 15 minutes for patients with distal occlusion. Uh, maybe due to, uh, it's not easy to make a decision about thrombectomy, we need more time. Uh, and then for, uh, from uh, acupuncture, we also need time to find out uh, best view, best projection. We need time to uh, precise movement of our tools. It's not, uh, not, not so easy to, to deal thrombus with tortuosity vessels as well. And I, 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 yes, I was going to ask you about this. Uh, could you find any differences in the clinical outcomes in, the, in these patients, uh, comparing them with the proximal patients? Yes. Unfortunately, in my hospital, the results of uh, thrombectomy for distal occlusion a little bit um, worse. I disappear, but it's it's really uh, for all patients uh, uh, a good functional outcome. MRS from zero to two is a. Was it stopped? Freezing in in Moscow, maybe. So, so sorry. So we are going to go on. It was the last question. So, uh, Dimitri, it, so we stop uh, with you. We can continue after, and we go directly to Dr. Gavrilovich. Okay. So he's he's going. Well, uh, Dr. Gavrilovich is interventionalist at the University Hospital of Udine in Italy, and uh, and so you are sorry. Okay, perfect. Your presentation. So please uh, tell us about your thoughts about digital locution treatment. Thank you. Thank, thank you a lot. Uh, and thank you for the possibility to share the experience about the digital occlusion treated in our hospital. So I'll uh, uh, try to uh, present you a few cases. And um, uh, let's say some aspects need to be considered before starting the endovascular treatment uh, at this level. So which are the conditions uh, of our patients? NIH level, ident identification of the occluded vessel, anatomy, territory of risk, hemisphere in the preliminary CTA and angiography. These are the um, fragments that we were not speaking a lot about. A personal experience, especially, and the completely the risk and benefit of this uh, assessment. Why? Because uh, the territory of risk is very important, and in the thrombectomy classification of vascular anatomy, it takes uh, it makes the only sense. Why? Because explaining the territory that which will uh, stay without the blood flow. So isolated. It is usually was thinking that small vessel occlusion means also the mild symptom, but also the literature is showing that isolated M2 or M3 occlusion show similar severity of disease. So this procedure we can consider just like the proximal occlusion. And general anesthesia is mandatory. So since we tried 
to treat uh, M2 segments with a stent retriever. And a situation like this, we have seen already from the 2015 to today. Because it's really easy in a straight line. But what's happening with the curves? When the vessels are becoming more tortuous, or maybe in a situation where we have the tortoise vessel, but also distal. Devices that we've been using till now could become difficult to retrieve. Just imagine front opercular artery and then stent retrieving it. Maybe using the small devices could solve the problem, but the so small devices, mini devices, could be less effective, especially with the white clock. So why not to use the aspiration? Which would be the right technique for the thrombo aspiration? The technique which the operator is more confident should be the right technique. So we should have the good proximal support, so appropriate length of the catheter for the distal access. So put it very well, the proximal catheter inside of the carotid. So if you're using Neuromax, try the tip enough length for the high acute patient. Sufficient length in the re relation of the therapeutics and the compatibility of the system that you're going to use. Don't get the length of the catheter. And the internal lumen of the aspiration catheter should be chosen properly to the treated vessel. So I'm trying to reach, if it's possible, one by one ratio with the diameter of the vessel. I'm going to show you a few cases. First case, this is the angel of the young patient, patient young for this pathology, NIH is 12, and uh, uh, RTPA endovenously didn't change anything uh, about the clinic. It was a spontaneous dissection of uh, internal carotid. And uh, we are speaking about the M2 occlusion in right hemisphere, and it's occluded the superior branch or of middle cerebral artery. And geography is showing this situation. And we have a distal occlusion. So, previously somebody was asking for the tips and tricks about the M3 uh, Max. Uh, this is my uh, the set. I'm using the Neuromax, drop as far as is possible in internal carotid artery. Then this was the case where I've been using directly 3 Max, but 3 Max is broken distally by the Chikai 018 black guide wire. And somebody would say, wow, it's very aggressive. It is very uh, stiff wire. But this wire brings me in a situation like this, that I can bring the distally uh, three max. So if we take a look in this situation, the diameter of far three max would be appropriate catheter for the treated vessel. It is smaller than a superior branch of MCA, but maybe could be the right catheter for the occluded vessel. We have to imagine the diameter of the vessel that is occluded. So I was looking of the inferior branch and thinking, imagining that the superior branch would be the similar diameter. So I'm bringing 3 max over 018 Chikai black guide wire at the contact with the clock. And then I'm starting with the engine aspiration. But this is the engine control just after the uh, thrombus aspiration. Why this happened? Occluded branch remains occluded. Wasn't, I was not maybe with the contact with the clot. Maybe it was a sticky clot. Or maybe I choose the wrong catheter for this vessel diameter. Maybe it was nothing of this. I'm trying to do the second pass. And again, over the 08 inch Kai Black, I'm bringing 3 max. And over 3 max, I'm bringing Jet D distally to be connected to have a contact with the clock. I'm con in a contact with the clock and doing the aspiration. This is after the second pass, something I gained. And the superior branch is partially reopened, recanalized, but it is still occluded distally. So I'm trying to do this third pass. The third pass I'm doing again, GK Black, 3 max, contact with the clock, and this is the result. So after the third pass, everything is open. This is the pine angel. 
So what was happening? If we take a look at the diameter of the treated vessel, this is the treated vessel that I recognized with the jet beam. But this is the treated vessel that was recognized with the three max. So what does it mean? Three max is not that was insufficient as the aspiration catheter was not right catheter for this treated vessel. If you take a look from the other side, about frontal, precentral, central arteries, and a lot of tortuosities that are presenting these vessels, I don't feel comfortable using the stent retriever in these vessels. And I found much safer using the thromboaspiration in this case. This is the CT, just comparing before and after. There is some small hypodensity, not clinically interesting. And the patient the following day was completely recovered. So I'm going to show you the following case. It's a uh, second one. Uh, this is the CT before the treatment. A uh, patient arrived three hours just after the onset of the symptoms, and NIH was pretty high. It was 18, but they were speaking about the M2 distal occlusion. So I've done the angel, and this is the angel. So we have the occlusion. Yes, it is the M2 occlusion, but superior and inferior branch are occluded. So I have started bringing the system over O18 guide wire. I'm bringing jet D and distally. I have the jet D at the beginning of M1 segment. I have a three max in the inferior uh, branch in a contact with the clock and doing the aspiration. But after the aspiration, partially was something recognized, but not completely. So I'm doing the second pass. And by the same guide wire, I'm bringing on the superior branch. I'm bringing in a contact with the clock, 3 max, just with the support of the jetty. And this is the result after the second pass. I'm trying to do the third pass. And distally, I'm distal M3 segment with the OA in guide wire. And I'm going to show you how 3MAX is acting in this situation. It is going over O18 guide wire in a contact with the clock. And from here, I stamping the thrombo aspiration. Partially remains occluded. Inferior branch is still occluded. And I'm making a mistake. So I punctured here something with, the go with my guide wire. So I'm leaving the superior branch. I'm moving to the inferior branch over Again, the same guide wire, I'm bringing 3 max, and over 3 max, I'm bringing the jet D in a contact. Why? Because previously, 3 max in this situation was inefficient. So I'm bringing the jet D at the contact with the clock and doing the inspiration. This is the situation after the pass with jet D, so inferior branch is completely recanalized. And this is the guide wire, how it looks like after. This is the angel control, and this angel control shows the occlusion of the precentral and central branch. So what to do? We know where we are. We are on the left side. So without these branches, NIH will not get down. I'm deciding to do one more pass. And this is the uh, this is the O18 guide wire and the uh, three max distal. So let me show you how is going the three max over the tip of this guide wire in a deep M3 segment. So it's right. I'm doing the thromboaspiration. This is how it looks like. This is the guide wire from this part, and this is the engine. This is the control, so I've been here. This is the engine with the parenchymography and the venous space. This is the clock that I took out. So, after the case like this, you would ask yourself how is it possible for a clock like this to bring with any standard? This is the CT the following day. Not so good, not so bad. And I'm going to show you the third case. The third case shows the situation uh, where I had the occlusion of the T, uh, T of uh, 
uh, carotid internal artery. Yes. Patient was uh, treated with uh, uh, RTPA and arrived uh, four hours, almost five hours after the onset of the symptoms. It was the NIH of 20. And uh, on the angel CT, the uh, carotid internal artery was occluded. But the angel was pretty different. And this clot was, uh, let's say, recognized or fractured by the endovenous DPA. We had the situation with the occlusion distal of the inferior branch, and we have occlusion of the anterior cerebral artery. In this case, I want to show you the tip that I used uh, in a situation where I didn't want to use O18 guide wire. This is the O14 Chikai black wire where above I'm using with a headway microcatheter. So I'm thinking about the length of the new Fremax catheter that made a lot of difficulties, also giving the distal approach with this length. But sometimes it is uh, very difficult to find the, the microcatheter that could fit with this length of the Fremax. So I switched the super catch with a short valve and there I earned something like three, four centimeters so on this image, you can see where is the three max tip and where is the heavy duo tip over the O14 wire, just by the switching the super catch with this short proximal head. This is the way I, I approach this uh, uh, distal A2, A3 occlusion, which of course could be treated in many different ways. And this is the solution just after the one pass of the thromboaspiration by Thremax. This is immediate uh, angel. We can see the lack of parenchymography in the same moment on the other side. And this is the CT control. Pretty bad. So the benefits of thrombocterin of small arteries must be carefully considered in relation with the risk. So at the beginning, I was trying to do it in a, a conscious sedation. But after the risks with, where I uh, faced, I stopped doing it completely in a conscious sedation. After the first pass, so after the M1, if I want to continue as an M2, M3 fractured distal occlusion, I'm asking for general anesthesia. Latest device is designed for distal uh, access with the excellent navig navigability that just like I showed with the three max in a distal entry segment, with the good guide wires, just like studied for the stroke treatment, will help us to perform distal revascularization and to achieve ticket rate. But unfortunately, in order to have a high clinical results, time cannot be underestimated. So we cannot recover parietina that we have lost. So thank you. This was my presentation, so we can discuss now about if there are some comments and uh, questions. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gavilovic. Thank, thank you. Uh, there are some questions uh, for the audience. Uh, yes. So wait, the, uh, Professor Spricknik is back, yes. So maybe it's a some questions we can answer directly writing because we are not going to have time to no problem, talk no uh, to talk about everything but i'm going to transmit you to you dr gabriel one of the questions i find interesting how many distal aspiration attempts do you perform before giving up yeah this is very difficult no? to to know when to to stop uh, and not only in distal also in proximal and do you shift to a small stem retriever at that point was a question from Nicola Cavazzini. Uh, so no, uh, st st distally, stent retriever, I would use just uh, in a situation when I see it, but this, which also, which kind of stent, st stent retriever or revascularization device. So I would choose something with the less radial force. If we are speaking about the distal straight segment, if we are speaking about the inferior branch, or if we are speaking about the A2, A3 segment, of course, we can use the state uh, revascularization device. But if you are speaking about the um, uh, cilian uh, fissure, and if you are speaking about the tortuous vessels, using the stent retrievers in this session, in this part of the vessel could be very, very tricky because after that, we are in a situation that retrieving the stent 
after the dose curves will just close the vessel. That is the reason why I asked before uh, if and how many person during the distal treatment are also using the nimodipine. Because in the treatment of distal vessels, I found it very, very useful just to identify the remained occlusion, what is patent, what is dissected, or what is uh, occluded still with a, a partial clot that moved distally. Uh, it is very difficult to decide when to stop and when to continue uh, the uh, distal thrombospiration, distal treatment. But if we are speaking about the prefrontal, precentral, and central area, central arter, artery, I will do everything to recanalize these vessels. Okay. Uh, the, the results of the of the poll question was uh, no nimodipine eighty two percent of the of the audience, and most of the patients. Uh, Keep using the RTPA yes, in, in these patients before the treatment. Yeah. And I, I would have another question, just another yes, one. Uh, when you do the combined treatment, uh, like uh, with this head, we do all this strength trigger, yes. distally, and the Fimax, do you like to do a kind of Solumbra or Arts technique? And when you retrieve the stent retrieval until the Fimax, do you uh, take out everything together uh, or do you keep the Fimax uh, on place? No, uh, thanks for the question. I'm never closing it completely. I'm doing the combined technique, so the pinching, pinning inside the catheter, and then bringing everything in the back, aspirate, aspirating from the ore, if I have uh, the uh, medium catheter, which would be in this uh, case, or Jet7 or Neuromax has to be in continuous aspiration, not to lose the... Or if you're using balloon occlusion, Long guide cutters than the occlusion of the uh, flux. Okay, okay, thank you very much. So Thanks. I think we have to keep on and, and we pass to the uh, to the next talk. And please, uh, uh, Dr. Kavilovich, Professor Skripnik, if you may uh, respond to some of the questions there, some answer these questions. So it would be great because we have no time to talk about everything. Right. And and so uh, we pass to the next talk. Is the uh, professor Karen Son? Thank you very much uh, for being here with us. Uh, he is a professor at the Sorbonne University and head of the Department of Interventional Neuro Neuroradiology at BTS Abiter uh, Hospital. So, in your turn, thank you. Thank you. He, he's, yeah, you are going to talk about something that is not a very good, a, a very Ah, uh, very. Uh, it's, it's not the best part because you're going to, to, to talk about complications. I will this, uh, make it funny. Yeah, but it's very important. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Good evening, uh, everybody. So, uh, as you told, I will talk about uh, mistakes and complications. So, uh, there will be blood. So, here are my, uh, my disclosures. And uh, so, uh, I will start with the first case of uh, secondary uh, uh, distal uh, thrombectomy. So, it's an 80 year old female with a right hemiplegia with an NIH at, uh, of uh, 27. You can see the, the infarct in the deep MCA territory, the occlusion of the left uh, MCA. So, here on the, on the DSA uh, during the mechanical thrombectomy, you can see the uh, ICA terminus occlusion. First uh, pass of aspiration with the uh, a68 and you have this result so here obviously you have a, a, a secondary distal occlusion in the uh, inferior division branch of the uh, mca the left mca and in the left aca so first we will uh, uh, target the most eloquent branch the mca m2 branch and second should we treat should we uh, recognize the uh, aca occlusion for sure, it was previously patent, and now it's occluded. It's an A2 occlusion, so you have no choice. You have to recognize it. It's a new territory, uh, uh, embolus. So here, 
the navigation, uh, we, we try first to do this, uh, this distal uh, thrombectomy with uh, uh, three max with the aspiration catheter. So sometimes it's not so easy to navigate the, the, this uh, aspiration catheter. So we always navigated over uh, a 14 uh, inches micro catheter, uh, micro guide wire. And we recommend to use a J shape. And when you cannot push your micro guide wire distally, sometimes you just have to push the, the three max as we did here. I will show you once more. So the three max was in the, the A1 segment and uh, we could not push distally the wire and we just pushed the, uh, the three max in aspiration and we recanalized uh, this, uh, this ACA. So in this secondary uh, distal occlusion, usually you have to treat them. Uh, you have to avoid the, to treat them only if it's a small and non-eloquent uh, territory. Another case of secondary uh, um, distal occlusion. So it's a 56-year-old male with a basilar artery occlusion. Uh, the patient received uh, the, uh, the IV thrombolysis and you do the first run and you have like a shower embolus in the distal uh, territories, both occlusion of both PCAs and uh, occlusion of the uh, left superior cerebellar artery. So here you have no choice, you have to recanalize these smaller uh, uh, branches uh, occlusion. So first we did an aspiration with a three max uh, in the left uh, PCA. Second, we did a second aspiration in the right PCA. And we tried to, uh, to go, so this is the result after the two aspirations in the PCA. And we tried to go with the three max in the left superior cerebellar artery, but the, the catheter was too big. So we navigated a, a smaller microcatheter and did a thrombectomy with a Stanford River with a, a good result. So for this uh, distal uh, uh, secondary occlusion, you have to treat them uh, in most cases when the, the territory is eloquent. So you all know that the, the, um, the benefit of the mechanical thrombectomy in proximal uh, occlusion, but what about the benefit of mechanical thrombectomy in primary distal occlusion? So from the, the, from the beginning, from uh, the beginning of the, uh, uh, the blooming of the mechanical thrombectomy, the neurologist asked us to, to do more and more distal thrombectomy. So here I will show you a, a good result, and afterwards I will show you some complications. You, you will see. So uh, in this patient had a sudden onset of aphasia. So here you can see the, uh, the MRI, the diffusion weighted image with a small infarct. You can see the blooming artifact of the, uh, the clot in the MCA uh, territory on this T2 two, two star uh, weighted image. And on the uh, MRA, you can see the occlusion of the inferior division branch of the uh, left MCA. So the patient has have, uh, uh, have an, an aphasia. And here you can see the, uh, the, the, the perfusion, uh, ASL perfusion imaging that shows you the, uh, the hypoperfusion in a large territory. So the patient uh, received the IV thrombolysis and was referred to thrombectomy. So you can see the, the defect uh, in, the, in the parenchyma uh, um, fed by the uh, inferior division. So as uh, previously told, it's not always easy to see where is the occlusion site. So you can do oblique projection and the occlusion site is here. So this is the target lesion. We navigated the uh, three max uh, aspiration catheter toward the target lesion and had a satisfactory recanalization with a small uh, spasm here, which was not significant. And the patient had a good clinical outcome with no uh, significant uh, uh, increasing of the size of the infarct. And uh, uh, you can see on the perfusion imaging at day, at day one, you have a nice for perfusion. So this is when everything goes well. So uh, we were very happy with this first cases of distal thrombectomy we did in my, in my institution. Almost the same patient, so this is uh, this patient, uh, uh, have a, a, a coronography and just after the, uh, the examine, the, this exam, he had a aphasia with an NIH score of 5. The patient uh, uh, has a coronary disease, so he is under aspirin and Plavix. So you can see on the diffusion weighted image, you have small, very small infarct in the left MCA territory. You have a slow, uh, uh, slowdown on the uh, cortical branch of the left MCA. On the, uh, on the tough image, it's not very easy to see the occlusion site, but you can see it very nicely on the T2 star. You can see the blooming artifact on the T2 star, so it's a distal occlusion. And you can see the hypoperfusion with a triangular shape, the hypoperfusion distal to the occluded branch. 
So the patient was referred for mechanical thrombectomy. He didn't receive the IV thrombolysis because he was uh, already under aspirin and Plavix. So uh, we tried first to do an, an aspiration with the 3 max. So we always navigate, as I told you, the 3 max over a, a, a 14 inches micro guide wire in J shape to be sure to, to not to have uh, distal perforation, to reduce uh, at least the risk of distal perforation. So we did a first aspiration, but uh, it, it didn't work. So we uh, did a second uh, uh, um, uh, mechanical thrombectomy with a stent retriever, with a catch mini, and uh, we partially recanalized the, the branch. There is still a branch which is occluded. You can see the clot which is here. But on the, uh, the, the DSA, the, the large uh, field of view DSA, you can feel, see some contrast material here uh, uh, just uh, close to the occlusion site. So it's a, it's a warning uh, image. Uh, probably we had a perforation here uh, uh, around the target lesion. And so we, 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 uh, we stopped the, the procedure because we didn't want to recanalize this, uh, this small branch because uh, probably we had a, a perforation uh, in this uh, small branch. So this is a CT uh, uh, just after the procedure that shows you the contrast extravasation in the, uh, in the Sylvan fissure. And we were uh, lucky in this patient because uh, uh, despite the fact that the patient was under aspirin and Plavix, we didn't uh, face uh, uh, um, an increasing of the size of this, uh, of this uh, subarachnoid MRI. So in this case, we were lucky and the patient had a good outcome. So how can we explain this, uh, this complication? Because everything was performed according to the, to the safety rules. We, uh, we navigated the microguide wire in J shape. We are very careful doing the navigation. So what can you, how can, can we interpret this complication? So you have this uh, M2 uh, occlusion, distal occlusion. The so cut is here and you, you know that we, we, we know that we have some perforating branches around rising from the M2 uh, segment. So probably you have these small perforating branches which are here. And so when you, you, you open the stent retriever and when you pull the stent retriever open, you will stretch the, uh, the, uh, the branch in which the clot is, uh, is uh, yeah, uh, okay, the branch of the target lesion, but also you will stretch the small perforating branch with, uh, which are attached to this branch and maybe it could explain uh, a bleeding that we uh, sometimes observe in M2 uh, the thrombectomy uh, by pulling uh, the stent retriever in these very small uh, branches. So um, uh, just a, a few words about this uh, this uh, publication. So here yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a publication which gathered a, 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 a few registries with more than one one thousand and six hundred uh, cases of mechanical thrombectomy. And in this uh, series, there was one percent of perforation, and it's important to note that about two thirds of this perforation occurred in distal mechanical thrombectomy. So you have much more complication in distal thrombectomy and it's uh, uh, often patients with a, 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 a stroke which are less, uh, 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 with minor strokes. So you have to be careful because the risk is higher and the benefit could be smaller. And you have to keep in mind this, uh, this sentence, God sees everything and your colleague, a neurologist, missed none of your complications. So be very careful when you go to, a, to, to perform a distal mechanical thrombectomy, you can have complications and you can worse, or you can worsen the, the, the case. So we know that we have in the armamentarium of the interventional neuroradiology, we have the dedicated stent retriever. We should use uh, the uh, small stent retriever, the dedicated stent retriever with a, a diameter of three millimeter. And also you have uh, the aspiration catheter. And as previously uh, uh, told, you have to tailor the size of your, aspi uh, of your aspiration catheter depending on the size of the, the vessel, the target lesion that you want to, uh, to reopen. And also you have this very small uh, stent retriever, the Tiger 13, which could uh, be navigated through a, a very small uh, microcatheter, 1.3 French microcatheter. So what was the, compar the comparison between aspiration and stent retriever in distal occlusion? So here, uh, a, a, a summary of the literature on this uh, topic. So the, the results and the safety and the, uh, and the effectiveness of both techniques are really the, the same. In our experience, the, the recognition rate only with 3MAX is a little bit lower compared to a, a stent retriever. But uh, there is no randomized trial comparing aspiration versus stent retriever in distal uh, occlusion. 
So I will show you another uh, complication, a 58 year old male with just an aphasia, uh, the NIH score is 4, the, pa the patient has a, a past history of a left MCA stroke that we could see here on the, on, on the CT, uh, the patient was under anti full anticoagulation for an arrhythmia and he has, he has a pacemaker, that's why he didn't have the MRI. Uh, so the patient has an, an, an aphasia with an IH score of 4, and you can see here the distal occlusion in the left uh, MCA uh, M2 segment. And uh, we perform the, the CT perfusion. I think it's very important to do the CT perfusion to see if the, the uh, uh, hypoperfusion is uh, significant and if we need to, uh, to do the, the, the thrombectomy or if the, if the hypoperfusion uh, area is very small. So here you have an increased uh, prolonged MTT uh, in this uh, area, which is just uh, uh, above the, uh, the, the seculi. So we perform the mechanical thrombectomy. So you can see the occlusion site, which is here. It's not always easy to see the occlusion site. So as I told you, you should use uh, oblique projection. And even sometimes you have to do 3D rotational angiography to depict very precisely the target lesion. So you can see here the occlusion site. So we, the strategy was to do a, a mechanical thrombectomy with stent retriever here. So the stent retriever which, uh, was a catch mini, which is deployed in the occluded branch. You can see here a run, a run while the, the catch mini is, uh, is opened. And so the, 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 stent, the mechanical thrombectomy was performed. Here you have the DSA run just after the, the retrieving of the catch mini. And here the uh, final DSA run. So it's a, a MT key 2B uh, score. There are some small branches that, were, that are, that are uh, still occluded. And here you have the post-procedure CT. So very often, as I told you, you can see a, a small subarachnoid hemorrhage, probably due to the when you pull the the, the stent retriever, you can stretch some very small perforating branches, and that you can can explain this uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Sometimes the evolution is good, but here. The patient worsened at uh, five hours after the, uh, the, the mechanical thrombectomy. And you can see the patient was under full anticoagulation therapy for his heart disease. And you have this uh, major uh, uh, bleeding in the ciliated fissure, and eventually the patient died. So this, uh, this uh, uh, hemorrhage, this subacnoid hemorrhage is a severe fissure, could lead to, uh, to a, a very bad uh, outcome. Another case of uh, complication, it's a 70-year-old male. He has uh, also an aphasia, the NIH score is uh, 6, so the, the diffusion is uh, almost normal, so there is no, uh, no infarct. And on the MRA, you can see uh, the occlusion of the inferior division branch of the left MCA. You can see the blooming artifact on the susceptibility weighted image. So the patient was referred for mechanical thrombectomy. You can see here the occlusion of the inferior division branch. So the strategy was to perform a, a, a mechanical thrombectomy with a stent watch cover here. So here you have recognition of this uh, inferior division branch after four paces of stent retriever. And on the final one, the operator uh, saw this uh, distal occlusion on the, on the distal aspect of the uh, left ACA. And he saw that maybe it could, uh, it could feed the, uh, the, the central area. So it could lead to a, to a, a significant deficit. So he decided to uh, perform a, mechan a mechanical thrombectomy in this small, uh, in this small uh, ACA uh, branch. So here you have the navigation of the headway duo in this branch, and the uh, operator used this uh, Tiger 13 uh, stent retriever. And after having retrieving the stent retriever, the, the, the operator had a bad feeling, so he renavigated the microcatheter in the SCA branch. And you can see here there was a perforation just by stretching, uh, I think, the, 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 this branch. Which, which is very distal and very uh, fragile. So you have, to, you have no choice, you have to coil this, uh, this branch huh, because uh, there is a, a, an active bleeding. And you can see here the CT after the, the procedure, so you have some subarachnoid hemorrhage. And eventually the outcome was not so bad. You have uh, an, an infarct in the ACA territory and in the left M uh, MCA territory. But the MRS, uh, the final MRS at six months was, was three, so not so bad outcome. 
And the last complication, so you can have a complication with stent retriever by pulling the stent retriever, probably by stretching the, the artery, which is uh, very uh, small with a, with a thin wall. But you have to be careful also when you navigate uh, the three max. You can have some complication by navigating the three max. Uh, I will show you a complication like this. So this is a 62-year-old male with a right hemiplegia. The uh, NIH score is uh, 22. There is no infarct uh, visible on the uh, DWI, no acute infarct. Uh, on the CTA, you can see this uh, uh, ICA uh, T occlusion, ICA terminus T occlusion. So the patient was referred for mechanical thrombectomy. You can see the, the T, the ICA terminus uh, occlusion. So first, a uh, uh, first pass of aspiration was well, here's the of, uh, 68. You can have a, uh, you can see here the, the, the recognition of the uh, ICA terminus and the operator on the lateral uh, projection uh, saw this. Uh, distal occlusion in the, in, the, in the distal branch, M2, M3 uh, branch of the uh, upper uh, division branch of the left uh, MCA. You can also note that the MCA, the, the caliber of the MCA is very small. Maybe the patient had ateroma or, I don't know, vasculitis, but the MCA is very small. So the, uh, you can see here the occlusion. So the operator uh, choose to, to do a, a thrombectomy in this branch and because there was like a, a, a cortical defect, a, a parenchymal defect in this branch. And so he navigated a, a three max catheter in this branch and he saw the catheter going uh, uh, outside the landmark of the, of the run map and did a run and you have this uh, catastrophic uh, event. So here you have no choice. Huh? You, the, 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 the branch was very small and the catheter, the three max went outside the branch in the subarachnoid space. So here you have no choice. You have to, to occlude the branch to, uh, to stop the bleeding. So the, uh, we injected 50% uh, um, uh, concentration glue. And here you have the, the, final, the final one. So the MCA is, uh, is occluded fully occluded, there, are, there is no active bleeding, but uh, the patient uh, finally died with a massive uh, infarct. So you have to, to, to keep in mind, should we do the uh, distal thrombectomy? Is it worth doing uh, the thrombectomy for a very small branch while we can face such a, 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 a severe complication? So you can see here, you have the somarachnoid hemorrhage and eventually the patient died from a, a massive infarct. So what are the take home messages from this uh, lecture? For, for distal, uh, secondary distal occlusion, you have to, to perform a mechanical thrombectomy only if you, you, uh, it's an eloquent or a large, a large territory which is involved. If it's a very small territory, like the, the last case I presented, maybe you have to, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to consider not doing anything. Sometimes it's, uh, it's safer. And for uh, primary distal occlusion, you have only to perform mechanical thrombectomy me for significant acute ischemic stroke. You don't have to treat minor stroke because you can have complication in patient with a, with a minor deficit. So the question is not, can I do it? Is, uh, the question is, should I do it? And you have also to uh, beware the intracranial hemorrhage while you uh, use stent retriever for distal uh, thrombectomy because you can have, even if you do it very well uh, with uh, safety rules, you can have some hemorrhage in the cilian fissure and you can face uh, a huge hematoma uh, uh, afterwards. Uh, in all institutions, we use aspiration as a first line strategy to avoid such uh, bleeding by pulling a stent retriever. And when it doesn't work, after two or three passes of aspiration, we use uh, the, uh, uh, the stent retriever. Thank you for your attention, and if you have any, any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Carlson. Very impressive cases and very demonstrative, and I like very much your take home messages. Yeah? Uh, sh should I do it? It's not, can I do it? Uh, should I do it? Uh, I, I will want you to make your question. Um, many some of the colleagues that are watching us today uh, maybe are starting to do thrombectomies. What do you think is the learning curve to perform thrombectomy in distal vessel occlusions? I think you, you, you don't have to, to start with distal occlusion. You under, if you, you ask yourself, should I do it? Maybe you should not do it because if you are not sure that you should do it, maybe that you, you, you don't have to do it. And also what we, we uh, recommend for the, the young uh, the, the, the fellow who are on call for distal thrombectomy is uh, first to, to see if, uh, if IVTPA uh, works. 
because uh, uh, rescue therapy is not, uh, is not a good strategy, I think, for proximal occlusion, but for distal occlusion, it could be a good strategy. Because often the, the neurologist call you and ask you to, to do may, maybe a mechanical thrombectomy for distal occlusion, and usually they, they do the IV thrombolysis, and one hour after the thrombolysis, the, the, the patient can recover. So maybe the first step is to, to, to do IV thrombolysis, and if it doesn't work, to come to the hospital and do the distal thrombectomy. But uh, uh, IV thrombolysis is very efficient in distal occlusion. So it's, uh, it's an important thing to take in, uh, in, in, to keep in mind. Absolutely. So we are going to pass to the next talk yeah, because uh, we are on the limit of, of the time. Okay. Thank you time. very much. So uh, we have another poll question uh, while I, I present Professor Schramm. Professor Schramm, uh, if you have a comment, uh, he's professor at Lübeck University and head of the Department of Neurology at the Slavic Holstein Hospital. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, we have this uh, small poll question. What is the biggest factor you consider when deciding on this type of uh, Please, uh, you can uh, vote and uh, we have a look later. Uh, thank you, Professor Sam, your turn. Yeah, vielen Dank, Pedro. Thank you very much for the kind introduction in German, actually. Well, yeah, uh, a warm welcome from my side to everybody. And um, actually being the last speaker in line does not necessarily make it easier, especially after we have seen so many excellent examples on how to deal with distal occlusions. So I would rather um, uh, use the last minutes of this afternoon, like Monty Python with the sentence and now to something completely different um, how I approach this special case and um, uh, these are my disclosures and the cases I have two short cases to to share with you um, done um, by myself or by uh, a senior register of my team and the first one is a 74 year old female she suffered from an acute stroke in hospital um, with a hemiparesis uh, at night after she underwent cardiac surgery with partial aortic replacement. And the bad thing with cases like this might be that um, it takes a while until someone with, let's say, neurological experience uh, recognizes that this is a stroke. And in fact, uh, this was the case here. So it took a while until the CTA the next morning was performed. And from the CTA, you might see that there's obviously a problem in the right vertebral artery. So the distal vert seems to be not opacified. And from a former CTA, I have to mention, we knew that this patient suffered from a chronic left vertebral occlusion. Still, you see the bezel R is opacified and you can see that obviously there's a red, red filling. Um, again, here the reconstruction, the 3D reconstruction from this case. Um, as you can see, chronic occlusion of the left verge. You can see the pica here, but the right verge shows also occlusion. This was obviously the case that happened during the night. So acute occlusion of the right vertebra with chronic occlusion on the other side. The operator here decided to use a radial approach with a seven French radial cheese, um, a slight uh, cheese slender. Um, we always give this uh, cocktail of nitroglycerin and verapamil, which is administered directly via the radial cheese. Then we perform a run to see the anatomy of uh, the vessel. Um, for the vertebral, or let's say vertebral basilar architecture, we always perform aspiration as, as premier line uh, and therefore the operator decided to advance directly with a jet D over an O35 guide wire uh, and also a Trevo track 21 microcatheter with an O14 synchro microwire for the inner guidance uh, and of course tubing and engine pump. And here you can see uh, this is already after the O35 guide wire has entered the ostium or the origin of the right word. And uh, just to clarify, that's uh, not as difficult as it might appear to many people. With a regular O35 guide where you usually have not much of a problem to enter the ostium of the word. And um, I'm showing this movie just to illustrate how easy the jet D then can be navigated directly over 
the O35 guide wire. And um, of course, from this position, then you have to perform another run. Um, these are images from that, and what you can see here that uh, I'm going to clarify this with the with the uh, red color here. There's contrast stasis in the distal vert, uh, as you can see here and here. So obviously, there is the occlusion. And the next step then would be to change the O35 guide wire um, by the micro catheter and the micro wire. And you can see how this is advanced carefully um, over the jet D. There we go with the micro catheter tip can be seen here. And then we advance the micro wire um, and going up over the vertebral architecture and especially the curves of the vertebral anatomy and once we are up there with the catheter tip you can see the micro catheter tip now here then you can see how nicely you can go up with the jet d without having any trouble of course it's not that much complicated the anatomy and the distal vert um, but however you can see how nicely this can be uh, brought up there I just let the movie run because now it's time to advance the microwire once again over the next curve. This happens now. And then after advancement of the microcatheter tip, which should happen now. Yes, here it comes. Here we are now with the microcatheter tip. And then hmm. what should be done then is to bring up the jet D directly from the radial to the thrombus in the distal vert. And that's basically it, because uh, the next slide shows after the first pass of this uh, ADAPT technique with the jet T, here was the occlusion site, we had a TK3. Now we've seen many good cases this afternoon, and the thing I wanted to share with you in this case is basically the excess. And um, JET-D certainly is a very good catheter, especially for distal occlusions. It's dedicated actually for distal occlusions. And it can reach very distal positions in the vascular architecture. Um, you can easily navigate it alone over an O35 when you're going radial. Any alternative for that? Of with alternatives, you can do other six French approaches, for instance, combined approach with a benchmark guide catheter, which can also be delivered uh, transradially very easily. And then you can use a five French select, for instance, to advance it over an 035 guide wire. Keep in mind that benchmark 071 has an ID of 071, and that, on the other hand, means, despite the fact that it's a six French, it works very well with the three max reperfusion catheter, but not with a jet D inside, of course. If you want to try a triaxial approach transradially, you can do that with a benchmark as well. But then you have to use another aspiration catheter. And the one which is working is the 5 French Sophia, because it's not tapered. It's, uh, it has a very low outer diameter. Um, and you can use it triaxially together with some micro catheter if you want to. But uh, usually, from our experience, it works very well to go up there directly not try actually just by actually with the jet D coming from the radio. Um, another case, um, always uh, uh, also with uh, with the posterior circulation, old lady, ninety four year old female, she was uh, brought to the hospital by the ambulance for a fall in the home after weakness in the legs and unilateral visual loss. And now, uh, upon arrival, uh, she had bilateral visual loss. And um, no hemorrhage, I'm going to skip the CT images now because uh, we're running out of time. That's basically uh, the beginning. It's pretty, pretty uh, uh, much the same case as we just saw in the other presentation. Just again, coming to the hardware, um, we have a bilateral P2 uh, occlusion. This is how we performed it. Usually, we use a Neuromax. In this case, the operator decided to, to use another long sheath. Uh, what is important, actually, from, from our perspective, is to stay with a stable position with a long sheath pretty close to the origin of the vert, and then insert the jet D um, via any microcatheter, in this case a very long one, a 170 centimeter prowler select, uh, and use a pump, of course, 
and then you can, like we did in this case, um, advance the uh, jet uh, D um, aspiration catheter directly to the clot. First, we did it in the left P2 uh, with this result, and then we went over to the other side, also with the jet D directly to the clot with the same result as on the opposite side. So um, these are my short examples. And the idea behind that was basically to give you some thoughts on the radial approach, especially when you're performing thrombectomies in the posture circulation. And having said that and looking at my watch, I want to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Fran. Very impressive cases. Uh, great. Uh, I would like to, to ask you, are you doing a regularly transradial approach for thrombectomy? Um, actually, for the for the posterior circulation, yes, more and more, not always, to be honest, but uh, uh, with many things, <laughs> as you know, um, it takes a while to get used to with the whole team, but uh, especially for vertebral and basilar occlusions, we tend to do it more often from uh, from the um, from the radial approach. Yes. Okay, I have I have uh, used it sometimes, not regularly, and I used to go with directly with a um, long sheath, uh, Neuromax or a ballast directly. Yeah, sometimes it works because then you, you can work uh, with with the catheter you want. Yes, that's true. Um, it always depends in the end on the vessel architecture, but just providing, uh, let's say, a cook receipt that uh, would work in the majority of cases, it, it is also pretty easy to navigate the jetty directly from a short sheath transradially to the vertebral so, origin. Yeah. Very, very nice case, yes. It's often said that adapt treatment is more effective wow. in the posterior vascular circulation. Do you think this is so? Why? Some, some people use it only in posterior circulation. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, we, we use it always as a first uh, uh, attempt, uh, uh, both in the posterior and the anterior circulation. But uh, coming to your question, yeah, you're right, especially after you mentioned the topmost data that were just published. And we, all, we know from, from other publications, like the, the meta-analysis from Ye two years ago with the Chinese uh, that just published their data on the posture circulation. Obviously, um, it's better to use ADAPT in the posture circulation. I mean, these are not randomized control diets, but, but from all data, it looks like um, it, it, it performs better than using a stent retriever. We always use ADAPT in the posture circulation. And personally, if you ask me, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but uh, some things might explain that the patients do better after ADAPT in comparison to stent retrieving. One thing is that you certainly have a shorter procedure time with ADAPT. And we know that uh, shorter procedure time is associated with better outcome at least in the anterior circulation, this is proven. And the other thing is um, people, people can sometimes call this uh, the cheese grating effect. I mean, uh, it, it might depend on the traction of the stent retriever on the vessel wall. You have more interaction with the stent retriever and the vessel wall than with an aspiration catheter, of course. And therefore, you might have a lower risk of injuring the smaller perforating vessel. That's not so much an issue in an M2 branch, for instance, but that might be more uh, uh, harmful if you look at the smaller perforating vessels to the midbrain from the basilar. Up. These might be two cases or, or two examples to, to, to try to explain why aspiration in the, in the posture circulation does better than stent retrieving. I have a, another thing to point that maybe um, doing adapt the basilar artery is easier than uh, doing it in the medial severe artery because it's straight. Yes. So it's easier to impact the catheter inside the, the, the clot. So maybe people that are not used to do adapt technique uh, uh, find it easier in the posterior circulation. Yes, so we, we are it. almost running out of time. I would just want to uh, ask you all, uh, 
this question that some people have uh, have done you know, today. Uh, when do you uh, when when do you use in digital uh, digital occlusions, aspiration, or or a combined treatment with a stem retriever? Do you uh, go direct to adapt, and then if it doesn't work, change to a stem retriever, or there's some 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 cases that you go there directly with a combined treatment? What do you think, uh, Professor Carlson? Um, as I told you, uh, I always use ADAPT as a first okay. line. The main issue is uh, when the, the vessel is very tortuous, when sometimes you cannot navigate the, the, the Srimax uh, distally enough. This is the only, the only cases in which I, I use a stent retriever. Otherwise, I, tr I try to use the ADAPT technique as a first line. Good. Good. Professor Spricknik? Yes, my front line strategy is ADAPT aspiration for these two vessels, of course. It's, uh, in my opinion, it's more safe. Sometimes if I see an uh, unacceptable anatomy, for example, very difficult angles, uh, calcification, sometimes I switch to uh, small microcatheters and stent triggers. But I also afraid bleeding after stent trigger in uh, this vessel. Um, I would like to say uh, some words about radial access. We often, uh, often uh, using radial access and sometimes it's more easy to access even for anterior circulation for example bovine arch uh, problem with uh, uh, abdominal aortic uh, peripheral artery sclerosis we saw uh, to uh, CT angiography from aortic arch as we see uh, acceptable anatomy we will go radial sometimes uh, radial is a uh, first our approach. If we try uh, to do my atherectomy through femoral, uh, if we have some problem in acceptable support, etc., I uh, again thinking about a radial approach before uh, uh, direct uh, cardiac artery puncture. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Gabriel Rich. Doing that normally in this television. Yeah, yeah, doing that normally. Yeah, depends uh, uh, which the territory is occluded, which vessel is occluded. If we are speaking about the straight vessel, as just like I showed before, uh, we can discuss and uh, uh, let's try uh, to explain it. Just to get the best medical treatment for the patient would be combination of two devices, so stent retriever plus thumb aspiration. If we are speaking about the proximal part, inferior trunk uh, or uh, proximal part of the anterior cerebral artery, so it means uh, A1 or A2. Distally, using the uh, stent retrievers uh, is becoming tricky, just like we showed and saw before. And then should be the option going on to the mini devices or devices that has a revascularization that has a less uh, radial forces. We are speaking about the tortoise vessel for sure, especially about the posterior circulation and the M2, M3 segments, for sure, the first um, approach would be the front respiration. Perfect. And again, if I have the appropriate diameter of the aspiration catheter for the vessel that I should treat, the first yes. approach would be, for sure, the um, front respiration. So th th I think you're right, but, but sometimes it's impressive because you aspirate with a small catheter and you uh, you achieve the recanalization just because the clot was very soft, and before the treatment you 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 cannot uh, know it. So sometimes I I, I, I yes yes it's, it's not just like Mr. Ball. Yeah, I, I, have a, I, have, I have a case. That it was impossible to 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 navigate with the it was an ACE uh, sixty. Uh, to the M1, it was just impossible, but I reached the clot with a three max to the M1, and I said, okay, I'm here, I'm going to one attempt. And after one attempt, the, I, the, the M1 was absolutely recanalized. <laughs> so sometimes the clot is very soft. It was lucky in that time, yeah? This is not normal, yeah? but sometimes it happens. Professor Rand, when, when do you change to a retriever? in these talocrucians? 
Um, yeah, in, in general, I would like to keep it as Vladimir said. So it depends a bit from from the anatomy, of course. Uh, we we always use ADAPT as a first line therapy, uh, despite the fact where we are. I mean, for frontal as well as for distal occlusions. But in some cases, especially in the distal parts of the vessel, it might be really challenging to to get the, uh, the the small aspiration catheter to its working place. And in cases where we just cannot get there, we cannot navigate it, then we switch to a combination of a small stent retriever like Tiger 13 preset light or a small tree or whatever uh, to combine it. But uh, in general, we have always the first line therapy with ADAPT. Perfect. So, I think we we may finish. We are on time. Uh, I, I would like to say thank you. Yeah, thank you to first to the professor for the excellent uh, lectures, uh, impressive and demonstrative. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the assistants for your attention, and thank you also to Penumbra for the organization of the webinar and for letting us talk about uh, our way to do trompectomies widely. Yeah? So uh, and a special thanks to uh, Julie, uh, Rose, Olaf Bayer, and Matthias Bringer, who have uh, worked uh, hard eh, to do this webinar. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Eh? And uh, stay safe. Olaf. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very thank you. much for the presentations. Um, bye bye. Thank you. See you. See you.